So we know every permutation can be expressed as a product of disjoint cycles. But even within the universe of cycles, there are some cycles that are more important than others, or at least easier to get our hands around. Those are going to be the cycles of length 2 that we call transpositions. In this video, we want to look at how every permutation can not only be expressed as a product of disjoint cycles, but it can also be expressed as a product of transpositions, probably not disjoint. And we can use that product that we write down to also determine a feature for every permutation called the sign of that permutation. So a cycle that has length 2. In other words, it's just the result of taking two of my objects in my set and just trading places. Such a cycle is called a transposition. One of the nice things about transpositions is that they're always their own inverses, right? If I trade places in two positions, and then I trade those places again, I get exactly back to where I started from. So transpositions are super friendly, right? They're their own inverses. And what we're about to find out is that every permutation can be written as a product of transpositions. So here's an example of a transposition. Let's say in the, in the symmetric group on eight symbols, uh, if I just take position two and position five and I flip-flop them, I get a cycle of length two called the transposition two five. And a transposition one three was a portion of the cycle notation that turned replays into parsley inside of S7. So let's see if we can figure out how to write this entire permutation as a product of transpositions, cycles of length two. So if I want to express this cycle of length 5 here in terms of transpositions, how might I do it? Well, to figure it out, let's just take the 2 and the 6. That I know the first thing that's happening in my, in my 5 cycle here is that 2, E, is going to position 6, which is over here. So let's suppose that I do that transposition first. What's going to happen is that my E is going to move into the position where I ultimately want it. right? Um, but my y is going to move over here into position 2, which is not ultimately where I want it to be located uh, in, my, in my final word, which my final word is parsley, remember. Right? So now I've gotten my e to be where I want, but now my y is out of position. So what I'll do is I'll take my y and I'll move it next to where I want it to go, which it turns out is position 7. So I'll take the 2 and 7 and swap them. And if I swap 2 and 7, my y moves into the position where I want it at the end of the day, but this s now is going to move to a place where I don't want it. So you notice what's happened so far is I've gotten position 6 and position 7 to be what I want them to be, and I'm kind of using position 2 as like a holding tank, right? A place where I can put something until I can get it to where I need it to go. Because where do I want my s to end up in the word parsley? I want it to end up in position 4. And indeed, that's the next in the line here. So if I flip-flop 2 and 4 using that transposition, then my s is going to go where I want, but now I have this l that's in the wrong space. I want my l to be in position 5, and so I'll do 2, 5 transposition to get it there. But in the process of doing that, notice that the a that I want to ultimately be in position 2 moves into position 2, and now I'm done. So this little algorithm that we just did is a way of taking any cycle, no matter what the length is, and expressing it as a product of transpositions. Again, I'm using the formalism here where I'm reading these from left to right. So I do 2, 6, and then 2, 7, and then 2, 4, and then 2, 5. Depending on the author that you're reading, they might use a reverse uh, of that process, particularly if they're thinking about matrix multiplication in the typical contravariant formalism. But now, what we've done is we've expressed this 5 cycle as a product of 4 transpositions. And as you might imagine, this same process abstracted out, I can express any k cycle as a product of k minus 1 transpositions. So what we've just suggested is a proof of the theorem that every permutation can be written as a product of transpositions. Why? Because it can first be written as a product of disjoint cycles, as we saw a couple of videos ago, but then I can use this process to express each one of those cycles, each k cycle, as a product of k minus 1 transpositions. And the next thing I can do is I can ask, well, how many transpositions did I ultimately need to express this permutation that turns replays into parsley? It turns out in this example I needed five of them, one, three, and then the product of these four transpositions, two, six, two, seven, two, four, two, five. The number of transpositions that it takes to express a permutation turns out to be a valuable commodity. And the way that we quantify it is we construct what's called the sign of a permutation. 
the sign of a permutation just differentiates between those permutations that are made up out of an even number of transpositions. We call those the even transpositions, and we say that their sign is positive 1. And those permutations that need an odd number of transpositions to express, we call those the odd permutations, and we assign them a sign of negative 1. So every permutation is going to have one of these two signs or the other, right? Either its sign is positive 1 because it's made up of an even number of transpositions, or its sign is negative 1 and it's made up of an odd number of transpositions. It's not immediately clear, by the way, that this process that we used to decompose a cycle into transpositions is the only way in which we could decompose cycles into transpositions. And in fact, that's not true. There are other ways that I could express a cycle as a product of transpositions, but what is true is that the parity, whether I have to use an even or an odd number of transpositions to express a given permutation, that parity is well defined. If you and I come up with different transpositional expressions for a permutation, we might get different answers, but we will both have an even number or we'll both have an odd number of transpositions in our answer for a given permutation. This permutation, for example, because we use five transpositions to express it, We'll call it an odd permutation, and we'll assign it the sign, negative 1. And the sign, again, is well-defined. We didn't prove this, but it's well-defined because if you and I come up with different transposition expressions for a given permutation, they might be different, but we will both use even numbers of transpositions, or we will both use odd numbers of transpositions uh, for a given permutation's expression. So this is a super valuable notion, the sign of a permutation. Because as it turns out, if we collect all of the even permutations together, they form a subset of the set of permutations, the symmetric group Sn. And moreover, that subset is actually a subgroup. We call it the alternating group on n symbols. It's the set of all even permutations of n symbols. That's what alternating group means. And the theorem here is that in fact it's more than just a subset within Sn. It's actually a subgroup. And just for fun, let's prove it. We'll prove it using a subgroup test. We haven't had the opportunity to do that for a little while. And we also haven't had the opportunity to use the subgroup test that we're about to use here. Because Sn is a finite group, let's try using the finite subgroup test in order to write a proof of this. Remember, the finite subgroup test says that inside of a finite group, if I have a subset of elements, all I have to do is show that that subset is closed under the operation of the group, and that will prove that it's a subgroup. So this is the finite subgroup test. To prove it, all I have to do is let sigma and tau be two uh, elements of the alternating subset, right? two even permutations, arbitrarily chosen. Because they're even permutations, that means that each one of them can be written as a product of an even number of transpositions. So let's say that sigma is alpha 1, alpha 2, up through alpha 2k. So all of these are transpositions, and there are 2k of them, which is an even number. Same thing with tau, beta 1 up through beta 2l. Even number of transpositions used to write uh, the permutation tau. So what's going to happen if I compose sigma and tau together? Well, I'm going to get all of my even number of alphas followed by my even number of betas. And when I look at the total, I have 2k plus 2l number of transpositions in this sigma tau permutation. And that, too, is an even number. And therefore, sigma tau belongs to the alternating subset, an. And hence, by the finite subgroup test, we've just shown that for any arbitrarily chosen sigma and tau in an, the product sigma tau also belongs to an. Finite subgroup test guarantees that means that an is a subgroup of sn. In fact, we can say more. How many even permutations are there inside of Sn? We can quickly show that there are exactly as many even permutations as there are odd permutations inside of Sn. Uh, and what that would mean, then, is that there's exactly half as many even permutations as there are permutations in general. And so that means that the order of the subgroup, now that we know it's a subgroup, we can say order, the order of the subgroup An is half the order of the subgroup of the whole group, Sn. And so it's one half of n factorial. One last comment before we wrap this video up, and that's about the orders of cycles. One of the nice things about cycle notation is that it tells you exactly what the order of these elements is. For a transposition, which is a two cycle, 
every transposition is its own inverse, so transpositions are order 2. We can also check that for a 3 cycle, the order of a 3 cycle is going to be 3. If I do this 3 cycle 3 times, 3 is going to go to 4, is going to go to 5, is going to go back to 3, and so 3 is going to end up where it started. 4 is going to go back to 5, back to 3, back to 4, so 4 is going to end up where it started. Same thing with 5. After 3 steps, it's gotten back home. So the order of any k cycle is just equal to k. And when I compose disjoint cycles together, we're not going to get back to the identity until all of those cycles have gone through their, their k cycle as many times as they need to. Um, we can show that the order of the product of disjoint cycles is just the least common multiple of the orders of the cycles themselves. So this is kind of a full set of properties for the expression of permutations as a product of transpositions, the sign of a permutation defined by the parity, the evenness or oddness of that number of transpositions, and the alternating group, which consists just of the even permutations of n symbols, turns out to be a subgroup of Sn that has half as many elements as Sn does.